Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass in which we will be discussing anticoagulant options for patients with venous thromboembolic disease. Warfarin is a very well-known and used drug. In the 1920s, cattle in northern USA and Canada were afflicted by an outbreak of an unusual disease characterized by fatal bleeding either spontaneously or from minor injuries. Mold made from sweet clover was implicated and in 1940, Carl Link and his student Harold Campbell in Wisconsin discovered that the anticoagulant in sweet clover was 4-hydroxycumarin that these cattle were grazing on that was causing this disease. Further work from Link et al. in 1948 led to the synthesis of warfarin, which was initially used as a rodenticide in the USA and very quickly, two years later, was licensed for human use in 1954. The name warfarin is de derived from WARF for Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation and ARIN derived from the coumarin. Warfarin has advantages. It's an anticoagulation that can be reversed by vitamin K. However, there are a number of disadvantages. It has a slow onset and offset. It requires bridging. There are numerous interactions with other drugs and foods a narrow therapeutic index, which means if the INR is too low, the patient is not anticoagulated adequately, and if the INR is too high, they're at risk of developing severe complications, including hemorrhage. There is marked inter-individual variability in dose response due to genetic polymorphisms that, are, that process this drug. And patients require regular INR monitoring, which can be inconvenient and costly. As a consequence, newer agents have been developed, which are called the NOACs, Novel Oral Anticoagulants or Direct Oral Anticoagulants. These drugs have a predictable pharmacological profile. There is a relative absence of major interactions with food or other drugs, but importantly, they do not require routine INR monitoring. And this allows us to shift to longer durations of treatment with patients with VTE to help reduce the risk of recurrence. Presently, there are no clear available monitoring systems for these drugs that are readily available and reversal agents are only starting to appear on the market now. Pharmacologically, warfarin inhibits vitamin K dependent cofactors, particularly 2, 7, 9 and 10. Anticoagulant factors such as protein C and S are also vitamin K dependent and so warfarin in the initial phase can serve as a procoagulant and requires concurrent administration with heparin. The oral bioavailability of warfarin is more than 95% but it has significant interactions with food particularly those that contain vitamin K which can abate the anticoagulant effect such as green leafy vegetables. It's hardly renally cleared, which means it can be used in patients with advancing renal disease. The half-life is up to 40 hours, but the onset and offset is rather unpredictable. Apixaban, Revroxaban and Edoxaban, all of the NOAX or DOAX which have an XA in their name, are direct factor 10A inhibitors. The oral bioavailability of these drugs is between 50 to 100%. Apixaban and Edoxaban do not have a significant food effect, whereas Rivaroxaban should be taken with food, particularly the higher dosages of 20 mg and 15 mg, in order for the concentration of the drug to be sufficiently present. These drugs, Apixaban and Rivaroxaban, are, rena are uh, renally cleared only at 27 and circa 33%, and so can be used with patients up to certain GFRs. The mean half-life of each of these drugs is circa 12 hours, but they have a rapid onset of between 2 and 4 hours. Dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Its oral bioavailability is rather low at 6.5% because this is a prodrug that's converted into its active form. There's no significant food interaction, but it's significantly renally cleared and so can't be used with patients with advancing renal disease. There are some key trials which led to the DOAX taking over warfarin in, in usage. 
Apixaban was studied in the AMPLIFY trial, in which 5,395 patients were enrolled in a double-blinded study, and in this trial there was no need for parenteral, uh, parenteral administration of anticoagulants. The NOAC dosing was 10 mg BD followed by 5 mg BD after 7 days. And this was compared against inoxaparin bridge to warfarin for 6 months. Dabigatran was studied in the RECOVER trial. Again, a double-blinded trial. Dabigatran 150 mg BD versus inoxaparin bridge to warfarin. And that was also for 6 months. Ravroxaban was compared in the Einstein DVT and Einstein PE trial which was an open-label trial which compared Revoroxaban against Inoxiparin and VKA. The Hokusai trial was used to study Edoxaban, which was a double-blinded trial comparing Edoxaban to Inoxiparin with Warfarin. Importantly, both Dabigatran and Edoxaban required parenteral anticoagulation prior to the NOAC administration. This was not concurrent administration, but prior separate administration, at least for five days. The AMPLIFY study, which was a six-month double-blind, active-controlled, non-inferiority study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, evaluated the efficacy and safety of apixaban alone with conventional standard anticoagulant therapy in oxyparin and warfarin for a period of six months. Patients were randomized to either the warfarin and inoxiparin arm or the apixaban arm. The AMPLIFY study demonstrated that apixaban was non-inferior to standard anticoagulation and also demonstrated that apixaban significantly superior at reducing major bleeds to inoxiparin. Moreover, the AMPLIFY study demonstrated that apixaban is significantly superior at reducing major or clinically relevant non-major bleeds compared to inoxiparin or warfarin. What was interesting is the AMPLIFY study looked at the time intervals comparing bleeding with apixaban and inoxaparin warfarin. The first phase where the apixaban was given at a higher dose all the way through to six months consistently demonstrated that apixaban was superior at reducing major or clinically relevant non-major bleeds. This slide adapted from a meta-analysis published by Venatal demonstrates that the NOACs are associated with less major bleeds. The AMPLIFY, the AMPLIFY trial studying apixaban significantly reduces the risk of major bleeding with a point estimate at 0.31 with a confidence interval of 0.17 to 0.55. The RECOVER trial Dabigatran also tend towards less major bleeds, however this was not statistically significant, as the confidence interval crosses 1. Einstein studying rivaroxaban also tend towards less major bleeds, but again the confidence interval crosses 1. This major meta-analysis has provided confidence in the usage of NOACs to treat venous thromboembolic disease. Thank you for attending this Medicine Masterclass.